born in 1947 in East Harlem, New York City. Felipe Luciano is a prominent and dynamic Afro-Puerto Rican public figure in the Latino community and one of its foremost activists, pundits, lecturers, writers, and journalists. He is a two-time Emmy award-winning reporter and was the first Puerto Rican news anchor of a major media network station in the United States at WNBC-TV New York. In 1969, he co-founded New York City's Young Lords Party, for which he also served as chairman. He currently hosts Latin Roots on WBAI in New York, which he originally founded and produced in 1972 as the first English language program in the United States to feature Latin culture and music and to develop an ethnically and racially diverse audience. Luciano was one of the four members and the only Puerto Rican of the last of the original Last Poets formed on May 19th, 1968. It was the first of several The Last Poet groups composed of Black Power era poets and musicians and mentored by Amiri Baraka. The Last Poets groups emerged in the late 1960s, birthed from the African-American Civil Rights Movement. Critic Jason Akeny wrote with their politically charged raps taught rhythms and dedication to raising African-American consciousness, the last poets almost single-handedly laid the groundwork for the emergence of hip hop. So I want to personally thank you because hip hop runs through my veins and you're one of the individuals that brought that out. Luciano is committed to community empowerment, ethnic pride and civil rights, born into poverty and raised by a single Puerto Rican mother. His passion for issues of social justice reflect the courage of a generation that organized taught and struggled against the powerful institutions <laughs> of discrimination. And today we are here to talk about that very subject. I'm humbled, I'm honored. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for having invited me. I thank God for have, still being alive. I recently had uh, a heart operation and I had to review everything. When you, your life is threatened, you begin to look at everything, starting from the beginning. I am about 12 blocks uh, from my birthplace. I'm a barrio boy, meaning I've been in El Barrio, my family has been here for 100 years. We are black Puerto Ricans and we are very proud of it. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. The loyalty that our family, we have certain pioneer families, we call them los pioneros here. And so I thank God I was steeped in this because my grandmother always, always told me, tu eres el negrito más sanuguero de este mundo. You're the prettiest that I know. And it was wonderful listening to that every year for 10 years. My mother had to fight the racism of our own people, the colorism of our own people here. The reason Puerto, Rican, Puerto Ricans moved out. That is, those que eran más clarito, ustedes que son más clarito, were able to move up north, were able to move to Midwest, were able to move down south, because you were fair-skinned. Didn't mean that you were any less Puerto Rican, and it didn't mean that you were any less African. But you were able to get by because of that. The worst thing about being a Black Puerto Rican is that you're Black and you speak a different language. So you're going through a double whammy. I... Love my color, always have. I love my nappy hair, I love my nose, I love my lips. And the closer I get to white culture, the more I realize what they're upset about is they don't have it. Mm. They would like to stay in the sun and get skin cancer. We got it already. They would like to have hair that's frizzy. They can't do it. One lady told me years ago, she said, well, if, I could only, if I could only be Puerto Rican, I love the hair. We have, we're the prettiest people on the planet. This is what I don't understand. Somos una gente linda. And we don't understand it. We go around trying to be them. They're trying to be us. You get it? So I've been fighting this battle for 50 years. I started out in El Barrio. My mother then moved to California. We came back from California. Uh, I ended up in Harlem again. Uh, with the problems that are always uh, uh, associated with Blacks and Puerto Ricans, um, I was always close to the Black community. Yo no entiendo cómo uno puede ser Afro-Latino y no, y no tener 
un sentido de ser africano. Yo no entiendo how that, I don't understand how that happens. Because I was centered in it. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the Pentecostal church. And by the way, the Pentecostal church is so much like Santeria, it's un, unreal. It's very close. Brincamos, gritamos, cogemos el Espíritu Santo, hablamos en lengua, we speak tongues. It is what it is. We are a rhythmic people. So I grew up understanding that blackness was my heritage and blackness was my blessing. It was my guide. It was my moral compass. I don't have to talk about ancestors all the time. Tengo abuela, mi bisabuela, tengo mi tía. They are my ancestors. And there's some bad black women. They're crazy, all of them. Was it difficult? Yes, I grew up without a father. That was very difficult. So I had to prove myself all the time. And on these streets in El Barrio, I'm looking at it now, on these streets, siempre había una pelea. So I grew up with violence all the time. I'm going to, I realized later, I've been diagnosed with PTSD. No es que, no es que, eh, no es que yo me meto en trobo. Um, es que I like to confront people. And I think that is the difference between Afro-Latino and many others. A mí me encanta confrontación. I like to jump in someone's face. I will not allow injustice to go on without me saying something. I don't care if the person is black, Jewish, Italian, I'll, I'll wring your neck. I don't know how I became that way. Maybe my mother, who is very much an outspoken, well, she's dead now, outspoken advocate. But I believe, and, and what's happened over the years, Puerto Rican blacks have become a little more passive. No quieren ser agresivo because it will be perceived that you're black and you don't have to be aggressive too. And it's hurt us. It's hurt us on the island. It's hurt us here in New York. We do not have the reputation of being aggressive in Puerto Rico. And I think that's a problem. We have the reputation of being great artists, Tite Alonso, Cortijo, Ismael Rivera, uh, Cheo Feliciano, name it. But we don't have the reputation for being aggressive. And I think to the extent that we're not aggressive and to the extent that we're not confrontational, independence in Puerto Rico is always gonna be a problem, always. I also think that we need, um, we have, what does it mean to be Afro-Latino? You got two continents and two cultures. Spain is not my culture. It's a patina. It has, uh, it's affected my language, but it is not my culture. It's a European culture. And I try to explain this in my lectures. Spain, Spanish people are European. They're not African. They don't have the compassion that Africans have. They don't have the skill sets that Africans have. They don't have the aesthetic that Africans have. It is like you're talking about Germany, only you speak Spanish. So that I never understood why people, no, que yo tengo, tú sabes, yo tengo eh, 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 sangre española. I, I, I'm a Spaniard. So the f what? What does that make you? So what? Being Spanish says what? What does it do for you? Meanwhile, you're sitting next to a black guy in school and you don't want to understand his culture. Afro-Latino means we identify with Africa. I always say this, Africa is my mother, Puerto Rico is mi, mi papa. That's the way I deal with it. Now, we have two impulses and we have two aesthetics. Um, I believe when you go to other countries, when you look at other countries in the Caribbean, and I'll stop after this, you realize that the Africans there built the system and confronted the, imperial, the imperialists and developed a reputation for being aggressive. In Cuba is the Mambises. In Cuba, all of the Africans from Matanzas were the ones who joined against in the first there were two 10 years wars um, in Cuba. Y son los negros que pelearon. To this day, we say, oh man, that guy is Yoruba, that guy is, in Puerto Rico, what we do is we say, si no tiene dinka, tiene mandinka. In other words, everybody got African blood. But that's not saying anything about our nature. 
In Haiti, it was those Africans, many of them soldiers already in the wars in Africa, who fought very hard for their independence. In the sense of Cuba, it was Antonio Maceo. It was Maximo Mo Gomez in, in, um, in uh, Santo Domingo. People fought hard. And of course, Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines in Haiti. What is it for us as Afro Latinos, as Afro Puerto Ricans, what do we have to be proud of? For me, it's El Bisu Campos and Emeterio Petances. Those are the two. One was Mulato, el otro era Trigueñito y Medio Negro. I know this must be shocking to some people because I think that some of us uh, go along to get along. And if you want to change, you've got to, you've got to incur the wrath of some people. We have Puerto Ricans who actually like Trump and voted for the fool. What is wrong with us? Have we gone insane? Something is wrong with the way after 100 years, 1898 to um, 1921, oh, more than 100 years of colonization, todavía in Puerto Rico, todavía, when you go to a store and a white American customer is there, they'll serve him first before they serve you. I jump all over them. I make sure they know what I'm talking about. Now, things are changing in Puerto Rico. People are beginning to understand who they are. A million of us marched on El Valdoriotti, which is the airport that goes from the airport through uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and not one American flag, not one. We got this guy out. What I'm concerned with now is now that Biden has released the billions of dollars that Puerto Rico is owed, that we're gonna see the corruption. We got 58 municipalities. I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna try to rob. And the reason for that is that we don't confront these guys. We don't catch them in their offices. We don't catch them in the municipalities of Macau, Guaynabo, and say, look, sucker, if you rob, I'm going to break your legs. Something's going to happen. You ain't going to get away with this money. This money is for the people. I'm not going to say we don't have it in New York. But we catch them, and we put them straight. All of this to say Afro-Latino has to be researched more. Where do we come from? We're basically from the Congo. I've often wondered why Puerto Ricans are so reluctant, and I'm not talking about you, uh, Julio, or the others on this panel, reluctant to talk, say they're black. I'm an Afro, I'm black, I'm, yes, soy Africano. A mi me encanta, Bomba en Plena is a black, most of it Haitian, by the way. We are from the Gambia, Congo area. Bantu. Bomba is straight up African. Plena is straight up African. Why do we run from it? Funny thing happens when you put something on the map. Have you ever seen people who don't, uh, who don't see how important they are and suddenly somebody takes pictures and puts it on the wall and they say, wow, mira Tintang, mira Panchin, mira, mira pan, pa, uh, Panchita. All of a sudden you see the beauty of your people. Puerto Ricans need to start understanding how beautiful they are. I think we're gorgeous. I walk through the streets um, with sometimes some sisters and white guys, I mean, their mouths drop. We, we are fine. Why do we go around thinking we're not? Yo no entiendo eso. We got to get rid of the colonialist in, uh, mentality that says if I have an accent, something's wrong with me. If my hair is too straight or too frizzy, something's wrong with me. Stop it. God doesn't make junk. And I happen to think that God favored Puerto Ricans because we the finest people on the earth. I'm not saying that because estoy aquí hablando a ustedes. Uh, uh, a, a sociologist said, if there's any perfect people on the planet, any perfect people, considering genealogy, son Puerto Rican. ¿Qué más quiere? We have everything in us. The Afro-Latino is beginning to rise. In Mexico, they have a special, they, they used to be afraid of being black. Now in Oaxaca, They've said, we want to be considered black. It's happening now. Hasta lo dominicano. Okay, chacho. Si uno de ellos, if you say a Dominican is black, he'll cut you three ways, long, deep, and serious. It's getting, they're, they're even becoming more black. And we need to help them along. You can't say you want to be black and you don't understand black American culture. I'm sorry. No, pero yo conozco, yo conozco la cosa de África. No. Do you know what the blues is here? Do you know who Muddy Waters is? Lightning Slim Hopkins. That's what you need to know. BB, uh, Bobby Blue Bland. You've got to know the blues. Not just Coltrane and, and Miles Davis. 
Do you go to church? Do you go to black churches and hear how they shout? It is important as an Afro-Latino to get to the core of blackness. Now, let me make this clear. There are many people who will tell you, many black people who will tell you you're not really black. You got the devil's blood in you. I used to go through that in jail. You got Yaku's blood in you. So I'd smack the black off of them. That'll put them straight. Don't you dare tell me I'm after all I've suffered, we are as black as any black man in this country. In fact, most of the Africans who came here did not go to um, um, the United States. 500,000 came here. Most of the millions of black people went to South America and the Caribbean. Para que lo sepa, okay? So we have African customs that to this day we still have. We have to stop feeling sorry that we are that we are Puerto Rican. Man, I, I don't understand it. Dominicans have slowly, since they've been here, since 65, since the invasion, have slowly begun to understand their blackness. It's taking time. And I'm helping them because I'm always in the community getting my haircuts and arguing with them. But I think eventually when black Latinos get together, we're going to have a potent force. And I've advocated within the culture of Latinos, I've advocated for an Afro, Afro Latino presence, not in name, not uh, in order to be cute, but to solidly, solidly say we are Africans and we identify with African liberation. I believe that we, we have something to say about everything that's happening in this world. Cuba is being they're trying to destroy Cuba through the embargo. What do Puerto Ricans have to say about it? And I don't care what the rest of the people say. ¿Qué dicen los negros puertorriqueños? ¿Qué dicen los negros cubanos? ¿Qué dicen los negros mexicanos? What do we have to say about it? What do we have to say about Palestine? You know, ¿qué está pasando ahí? Now they're ganging up on Iran. What do we have to say about these things? What do we have to say about COVID? I didn't see a Latino voice against Trump. Pendejo que. What is it that we need to do? And we need to organize ourselves so that we understand that if it comes down, we know whose side we are on. We're not going to take a middle road. Si la cosa, hay gente que creen que vamos a pasar por una guerra civil. Do you think we're going to go through a civil war? What, where do you stand with it? Or do you want to be beige and decide you want to pass? It ain't going to happen. Esta gente odia los latinos. And my feeling is, personally, now I'm going to shut up, that they're more afraid of Latinos than they are black folks. Do you know why? Because we have so many of us. They don't know what to do with us. They're having a problem. We have babies like it's going out of style. We'll have a Mexican. We'll have a president soon. Where do you stand? Who do you identify with? No, no, you don't want to identify me. I don't want to identify with those black people. They're crazy. Son gente vulgar. So, que no tienen culto. Come on, man. That's that's ridiculous. We have MS-13 and they're the most vicious little creeps. I wish we had them here in El Barrio. We take care of them in two seconds. Shoot them in the head. They wouldn't dare do some of the stuff they do out on Long Island. Enough of my stuff. I open it up. No, no, but I, I, I appreciate the conversation and I wanted to start off with that because I really wanted, you know, the intersections between black and brown because we are in this struggle together and ultimately we have to have each other's backs. And when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about advocacy, we're talking about activism, we're talking about allyship. Yeah. What, what does that mean to Felipe Luciano? You've been engaged in advocacy, activism. You have been there for many years. Um, what are your thoughts on advocacy and how we as a people can advocate not only for ourselves, but for each other, especially when we're going and we're talking about the machine, we're talking about the system, right? We're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about really making sure that we have the opportunities that we know we're capable of having. We are intelligent. We are individuals that are professional. So what does advocacy, activism, and all of those things mean to Felipe Luciano? Well, it means that there is a core of righteous indignation in your soul. It means that you have an infinite capacity for compassion. 
It means that if you're a Christian, when you see a child in the street who's going through change, y que no tiene casa, y tiene los mocos saliendo, that you realize you see Jesus in that kid. You see Jesus in that homeless person. You see Jesus in the Mexican, in the Dominican, in the Nicaraguan, in the Honduran. You see Jesus there. If you're a Christian. I am a Christian, I'm a socialist, and I'm a radical. And the first thing that I think about when we talk about being an activist is scholarship. I find that too many of us are willing to jump up and shout, and we haven't read one book. It's sad. I understand, I believe in righteous indignation. It'll make you do things that, because our parents revolted in many cases and they didn't read a book. But we have the opportunity in this country to go to school. We have to get Latinos and smack them upside their head and say, tú a la escuela, you're going to go to school. Because too many of us are proud of being Puerto Rican, proud of being Dominican, proud of being whatever, and we don't know a damn thing about our countries. Scholarship is absolutely crucial. We need Cornell West. We need Martin Luther King's. We need Malcolm X's. We need Emeterio Betanza. We need Albizu Campos, who, by the way, spoke seven languages, was the first Puerto Rican to graduate from Harvard. They offered him a, 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 an ambassadorship to Peru. He was an amazing man. He was not uneducated. People who think that it's the street guys who are going to lead the revolution are sorely mistaken. We built the Young Lords on educated dudes. By the way, the Panthers are the same thing. Bobby Seale was a NASA scientist. Huey Newton was a PhD. That nonsense about being militant means you have to be uneducated is simply not true. Please read. The other thing, please travel. Because when you travel, you'll be able to see the advantages of this, of, of this country and the disadvantages of being American. So when you travel and you begin to see other people, Italians, Japanese, my particular specialty is, is the Middle East. I happen to love it. I love Jewish culture. I've studied it for years. Um, I love African culture. I love Chinese culture. I've been to China twice. Get to know who, what the world is. Puerto Latinos, we are, as Afro-Latinos, we're, um, uh, we're not reeds in the wind being blown up, up from tempestly. We have to know who we are in time and place. I believe that the future is in the Caribbean. That eventually the world is gonna come to our need, come to our places and say, please teach us how to, how to handle diversity. How do you guys handle it? But first we have to understand it ourselves. We have to get rid of the vestiges of colorism in us, get rid of the actual hatred that we have about ourselves and stop constantly kowtowing to, uh, to, to those who exploit us. That means that we must confront when it needs to be confronted. Does that mean you're going to be successful? Not necessarily. I'm not a millionaire. And I've been fighting this battle 50 years. But I will not allow my people to be um, oppressed or suppressed by their racist concepts of class and eth ethnicity. No. So when I think about that, I think the first thing I think is that um, you got to stand up. You got to kick ass. You got to be a scholar. If I had to uh, offer one solution to a lot of this, I would say, first of all, get your education. That doesn't mean that you run away from confrontation, but get your education. Um, when I was growing up, uh, the reason I got away, I, used, I was in a lot of gangs. And the reason I got away with a lot of it, I always carried my books with me. Y yo siempre tenía una cha un chaqueta con, with its elbow patch, Elisa. You know those... Uh, Scala things, and we would jack somebody up, and the cops say, "You, get, come over here. You, Smiley, come over here. What are you doing here?" And I say, "Excuse me, sir. Perfect English. Excuse me. What what happened? Somebody just got beaten up over here. What do you mean? What happened?" I said, "Really? I, I had no idea. I, I'm, I'm going back home. I'm, I'm, I'm coming home from school." And the cop would not believe. How could he believe that I did it? <laughs> Use what you have to get what you need, baby. That's the name of that tune. I respect that. I definitely respect that. Now, let me ask you a question. I'm going to try to change um, a little bit and look at more of the workplace, the establishment, yeah. right? We look at 
Um, I just read something the other day. I believe there are a total of, I want to say 16 combined Black and Latino CEOs in the Fortune 500. That's it. Out of thousands and thousands. So how do we embrace diversity in the workplace? How do we embrace change? What is the importance of change, diversity, opportunities for change, cultural shift, and its impact personally and professionally, right? Because when we look at it, whatever it is that we do professionally is gonna affect us personally and vice versa. So how do we bring about that change within the structures? How do we Good question. work towards eradicating that systemic racism? Polito. Uh, has anybody seen the film Elliot Ness and the Untouchables with Kevin Costner? Yeah. Anybody ever seen it? At one point, Ke uh, Sean Connery is dying and he tells Kevin Costner, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to sacrifice? We are going to achieve nothing unless we're willing to sacrifice. And I find that that's the dividing line between men and warriors. We have to develop a warrior culture. We're at war. I don't know how many whether people know this or not, but we're being killed. You know how many Puerto Rican right around, you know how many Puerto Rican inmates there are? You know what's happening now with the drug situation? You know what's happening with COVID and how many of our elderly are being killed in these nursing homes? We have to develop a warrior culture. And what that means is. We have to be willing to sacrifice. Albizu Campos said, it's a trite phrase now, la patria es valor y sacrificio. The country is, the, the motherland is valor and sacrifice. You can't be a punk and join it. And you got to be honest with yourself. Si tú no quieres pelear, no te meta. If you think that this is going to be a heavy, stay, stay out of it. And stay out of my way too. Porque hay gente que no se quiere meter, meter but they're going to be the first ones to tell the police who you are, what you're doing, and become agents. Stay out of my freaking way. Don't get in the way. Siempre hay gente que cuando tenemos reuniones. No, but are you sure? I'm not sure. I, 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 I always bringing up, I call them agent saboteurs. They sap your strength with needless talk. What do you need? How do you get it? There are three factors in organizational, uh, organizational militancy. A ideology. What do you believe? We have some people que no creen, they, they don't believe that you have to fight. They believe in making money. Fine. Do you understand that that money should be geared or at least should be, the, the program should benefit that community? So ideology, what do you, who are you? This COVID thing is making us aware. You better sit down and think about what you want to do for the rest of your life. I've had to do it. I've got 30 years, if that much, on this planet. What am I going to leave behind? Ideology is what do you think, how do you attain power? How do you attain it? What's the framework for it? Number two, leadership. Our problem is that we have a quítate tú pa ponerme yo attitude about leadership. I am not, I'm going to mess that guy up. Tú sabes una cosa, yo vi esa señora con otra mujer y estaba besando. We are, we are Radio Bemba to, for the, to the rest of our lives. How dare you speak about a sister and you don't even know her? People have to shut that kind of talk down. They tried that with Fidel. They tried that with Albizu. I'm telling you, we've turned ourselves in. So leadership is, at, if a person has charisma and has a, a skill set, let them, man or woman, let them work. If they fail, then get rid of them and put somebody else in. Leadership is crucial in the move toward empowerment. The third you. element of this is organization. I marvel at people who think that if you have a charismatic leader and you have uh, an ideological standpoint that you can make things happen. You can't. Where's the organization? Who's knocking on doors? Who's printing the, the material? 
Organization means there is an infrastructure that takes care of those things and takes care of it. And people don't need the publicity. They want to make it happen. You see me here, hablando toda fire and brimstone. That lady behind me is the one who pushes all, all the, she makes sure I get in, in on time. She makes sure I get on this thing. You don't say nada de esto. Technology is, forget about it. But she stays on my ass. Organization. Kwame Toure, whose uh, American name was uh, Stokely Carmichael, said, you cannot make, and there's no revolution that occurs without organization. So I'm glad that the Ibido American organization is out there, and I hope it continues to grow. But I'm going to tell you now, the one question, the one definitive question about that is what are you willing to sacrifice? I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Thank you. Um, as far as being an intentional, I like to call it an intentional accomplice, right? I like to, a co-conspirator yeah. in, in, this, in this world that we're living in, we're striving for diversity. We're working, like I said, personally, I work with organizations to give them the tools to develop within their own organizations um, what is required and what is needed to introduce and really um, empower diversity, empower um, individuals to, to really thrive within those organizations. So what, from an organizational standpoint, would make someone an effective ally, um, would make someone understand how to better relate with individuals um, from a personal and professional perspective? I like to use the word inclusion. Diversity means you have a multi complected staff. Everybody's a different color. You got all the nation rep nations represented but there's no inclusion in real power. If there's no inclusion of real power, people who can actually make things happen, it is a game. It's a game of charades. I used to lecture a lot for, uh, for all of the for Fortune 500 companies. I would go in and I would do a slam bang, standing over, oh yeah. In the next month, nothing would happen. And I realized that what they did is they, would, they were appealing to their employees a sense of fascination um, with politics, with um, what they think is right. Diversity means you're putting people in all levels, not just human resources, but putting in people who actually have the power to hire and fire. I don't want to hear all that stuff. No, we, we can put him here. We, no, no, no. Where are the levels of power in organizations? And you have to be willing to confront in, a, in as nice a way as possible, all of you look like decent individuals. You don't scare me if you came into my meeting. I would put Elisa out front. <laughs> and I would, and, but I would back her up with a to a serious. They would know, uh oh, este huevo quiere estar. You have to do that. You have to be willing. Now, Elisa may not want to do it, but I would force her to do it because she is the mildest representation of who we are. They have no idea what's coming behind. Many times, the people who are the quietest are the ones who stab you 13 times. We see that on the streets. What we need is people willing to sacrifice and go all the way. What does that mean? You're not going to be like, para la gente que quieren ser agradable, go home. This is not a popularity contest. I still fight every day on the street. Ah, radical, comunista, contra. They are people who don't understand that the fact that they have breakfast programs on these streets, the fact that they have uh, that they have welfare benefits, the fact that the police don't come here and kill you randomly is because the young lords put their lives on the line. I was stopped by some Dominican cats in the subway. And one guy said, uh, is your name Felipe? And I said, yeah. He said, damn, but un dominicano lindo, lindo, big guy, big chest. And I said, how you doing? He said, hey, every once in a while I'm going through changes. I said, do you want to grow in this department? Do you want to grow in this field? He said, yeah. I said, are you going to take the sergeant's test? He said, I'm not so sure. I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. 
I said, you better take the sergeant's test. Y le agarré. He was in shock. I grabbed him and I pushed him closer. I said, man, you better take the sergeant's test and you better take the captain's test too. Because here in New York, what happens when you take the sergeant's test is so when you take the captain's test, you have to go back to the precinct that you were in. You, nobody wants to go back to the home base. When I was at NBC, I would beg them to give me uh, ghetto stories. Tenemos Latino que no, 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 no. I've, I've been past that. You know, you know, I don't want to go back to poverty. I don't even want to remind myself of poverty. Are you crazy, sucker? That's where your mother's from. Y tu abuela donde está? You better go back there and do those stories. And so they knew that if they needed someone to go into a dope, uh, a dope den, it was me. I did it voluntarily. Plus, I knew half the guys anyway. But that's the deal. How do you keep yourself rooted? Stay close to the people. I don't care how popular you get, how much money you make, stay close to the people. And I find that the most important thing is having a sense of self, not looking to uh, redeem yourself or validate yourself with everybody else, especially the companies that you're going against. So if, you're, if, if we're going to push Adrian and we're going to push him, let's make sure that we protect him. Let's make sure that we push him and not take no finance. Now, make sure Adrian is as complete a project as we can make him. If he has a, a, a rap sheet, let's make sure we know that. Um, if William Trons has a rap sheet, let's make sure we know that. If he got busted last night for DUI, let's know what it is. Let's be aware of what product we're representing. Hay mucha gente, no, he's all right, but the cat is a creep. Nobody would want him. Don't blame the white system. Let's blame us. Finally, um, and I'll stop with this. If we have faith, and here's where Christianity for me comes in. Yo soy medio musulmán. My brother was the first Puerto Rican Muslim in this city. Y si ustedes eh, han visto la, las los acciones de los musulmanes en este país, nobody messes with them. Why? Why do you think? Hasta los puertorriqueños saben que cuando pasan un, 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 what do they call it, ¿Cómo se dice eso en español, Elisa? Uh, 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 un mec Come on, you know what it is. A mask. Tú sabes, hasta los puertorriqueños, los íbaros, que no saben hablar inglés. Salam alaikum. They know. They know what time it is because se merece respeto. We have to do that in our communities. We have to get to the point where when you walk into a Puerto Rican community, you respect that community. Police, educators, social workers, construction companies, the city respects Puerto Ricans. And that means you have to be worthy of respect. How do you do that? Sometimes it takes scholarship. Sometimes it takes prayer and making sure our ministers are a lot more militant. Porque tenemos unos cuantos ministros que son como mierda. I have to tell you straight up. Y tenemos priests the same way. We have to be able to tell, hey, you better, I don't know about your sermon, bro. We have to confront them the same way Jesus confronted um, the, the, the clergy at his time. And sometimes you have to punch people in the face. Con eso te lo digo todo. I want to I wanna leave um, some time to have some questions. I see there is a question in the chat now um, from Ray Mayolis. If you can share one thing that would help guide our youth to understand their culture in today's world, what would that be? So if you can share one thing that would help guide our youth to understand their culture in today's world, what would that be? A music appreciation course. Music appreciation? Our music says it all. You don't have to go see books. Listen to Johnny Pacheco records, who just passed away. Listen to Cheo Feliciano and see Cure Alonso, Tite. Anacaona, Babalia, um, uh, listen to the songs of Up From The Roots, slavery songs that we have in Puerto Rico. Listen to the music and never, for, never let the music go. Keep the music going. We consider salsa some sort of bastard. Oh, that's all right. It's not really classical music. Are you crazy? That's our music. They did the same with jazz. They tried to bastardize it. They tried to make it less than it was because it was always performed in brothels. Well, same thing with Latin music. 
Teach yourself to dance. Go there and learn how to dance. Move your butt. I don't trust uh, activists who can't move their hips. I'll be honest with you. Yo voy a un sitio y toditos están hablando la política y no pueden bailar. How are you going to organize people if you don't understand the music? How are you going to organize if you don't understand hip hop? How are you going to, you, you got to know what Bad Bunny's doing. You got to know um, what Tego is doing. Understand what the relationship between music and politics is, and it's deep, it's umbilical. All so right. that's what I would do. I would start with music. Culture is the spear point of all revolutionary activity. And it is when culture becomes revolutionary that they begin to arrest poets. And when that happens, we'll know that we're near the point of victory. All right, I have a question from Ricardo Nieves. Do you feel that Latinos, Puerto Ricans in particular today are complacent? If so, why and what should we do about it? There was a time when I took for granted Puerto Rican complacency. That time is over. I go to Puerto Rico y yo hablo con los viejos and they are aware of what's happening. They're aware of how fragile this system is. That hurricane killed 7,000 people. Harvard says it wasn't 700, 7,000 died. And the way they figured it out is if your grandmother was in the hospital at the time and she couldn't get, she was diabetic and she couldn't get uh, saline solutions or whatever it was that was needed, if the electricity stopped, that's a death that's caused by the hurricane. We lost 7,000 people and the governor lied about it. Now, a lot of the young people are going into the country starting their small communes. Yo no sé si ustedes van a Puerto Rico mucho, but if you go to Adjuntas, if you go to places, Alajas, if you go to um, uh, uh, places on the West mainly, you'll see people are beginning to take care of business. They're realizing, esto puede pasar otra vez, how are we going to eat? Get off the grid. There's a place in Adjuntas where no electricity is used. Everything is solar. There is an opportunity to begin to develop self-sufficiency. Puerto Ricans are learning. You cannot depend on the United States to save your life. How do we begin to develop self-cash nexus? And it ain't through Bitcoins. It's through deciding that our country is a um, is an echo is an echo, is an echo tourism plot spot. We are we have four temp we have forced uh, climate zones. People should be pouring into our country. Why aren't they? What has the Puerto Rican government done to make sure that it happens? Why is it that everybody else, Jamaica, um, Caicos, uh, Saint Nevis, Saint Kitts, all have great advertising uh, plans and we have nothing? Have you seen some of the stuff in Puerto Rico? It's disgusting. I don't see it. We need new campaigns to get people to spend some money. I tell all my black men, man, I love y'all. Y'all, man, I love Puerto Rico. Fine, spend some money in Puerto Rico. Put some money in that. Also, we need to go back and buy some land. We need to take over by buying it out. We are complacent because we've been taught to be complacent. America never wanted, never wanted revolutionary Puerto Ricans. When they came in, the first thing they did is told the church, tell them that revolution <clears throat> is suicide. So the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Baptists, um, uh, all of them got together. They set, they set up Puerto Rico in different quadrants and they went into each of those areas. Hablar de Cristo. Y nada más. If you are only talking spirit and you're not talking politics, something's wrong with you. Christ was not, and I'm gonna say this thing, Jesus was not about no works, faith and good works. He hated Rome, he hated the rich. And he was again, he didn't die because he was the son of God. He died because he was political because he was saying it's time to move. Rome is not your friend. Well, I'm saying Washington DC is not your friend sucker. Begin to take it to the cross. Begin to de uh, defend yourself. 
Despierta Boricua defiende lo tuyo is something I really believe in. We need to really get together and start making our own money. And if that means, si a mí me llaman y me dice Felipe, uh, are you willing to come here for five years? We'll give you a house. We'll give you a little bit of land. Um, but I want you to teach kids, start the lecture. I would do it. I'd leave this place in a minute. Haven't gotten that call yet. But I know that's the kind of commitment we're going to need. All of us need to get back there and start talking. ¿Qué puedo hacer para Puerto Rico? Do you know how many schools were closed after Hurricane Maria? How many hospitals were closed? They need Elisa, they need William, they need Adrián, they need Ricardo, they need you. They need us there. Now, here's the problem. Todavía tenemos elementos en Puerto Rico que son nacionalistas. Ustedes son de allá. What do you mean allá? Your monkey behind stayed here because you couldn't leave. Or you had so much money, you didn't need to leave. So let's get past that nonsense. We are Puerto Ricans. I tell kids que tienen un porcentaje de sangre Puerto Rico. You're Puerto Rican. <laughs> I told the kid the other day, he said, well, my mother's Spanish. That's the new thing. That my, my mother's Spanish. My father's Spanish. I said, Spanish? What are you talking about? Who's Spanish? Well, you know, he came, but he's not here anymore. And I said, what, what town is he from? I don't know. And I tell these kids, I tell these black kids, your mother, your father's Puerto Rican, boy. You better start reading about it because that's where you come from. So we need to start beginning to include and stop thinking that we're better than anybody else. The problem is that Cubans do that. Some other uh, uh, Argentinians or Chileans, they begin to think that they're better than us. I still see Dominicans who talk, mira, the colonialism is unbelievable. No, que ustedes no quieren trabajar. Man, they, when they see my eyes, they decide to take that back. We put our lives on the line for them. We were the ones who took the, hit, the heat for Dominicans, Cubans, Spaniards, and everybody else who had a Spanish surname. What we need to do now, okay, uh, what we need to do now is let people know it. We the ones, man. We the ones. And by the way, and we should give credit to black people for having suffered a lot for us. The Panthers suffered a lot for us. And I always give them credit. Take, let's take the next question. How, how do we overcome the crisis of political disaffection? In previous generations, people were more militant and class conscious. Currently, it exists residually and it causes incongruities such as the working class voting for those who go against their lives. That has to do with colonialism. That has to do with self-hatred. Um, organizing and confronting that sort of apathy is the only way it's gonna stop. Sometimes you gotta let people die. There's a saying in the Bible, don't pour new wine in old bottles. Don't waste your time talking to older people que no que son cabeciduro, it's not worth it. Go to the young people, go to the youth, speak to them, fire them up so that they're ready. They, their parents may get on them, they may, they may get beatings when they get home. Speak to them about who they are and how proud they should be. And the way, and that's the way to do it. We've had a history of colonialism for years. We've had people put in jail, tortured. We had a group of soldiers in Korea called the Borinke, Borinkaneers. Do you know who they are? 365th. They were in Korea and this white uh, commanding officer made them, wanted them to take a hill, which we now call Porkchop Hill. And they were dying in huge numbers and they said, we're not gonna do it anymore, as they should have. Well, they were called cowards. And for years they lived with that stigma. Finally, they got the medals they deserved. But you have to be willing to stand up for what you believe in and back your brother up. Now, I am not suggesting that we back people up that don't deserve to be backed up. Si el tipo un pillo, He's a thief, period, the end. If he ain't no good, he ain't no good. So that's why I always suggest getting the most qualified people and be careful because those who are qualified, very, sometimes they're educated, have no heart. There's no courage in them. I see ministers like that. Gloria a Dios, aleluya. They're so spiritually uh, uh, adept, so spiritually bound, they're no earthly good. I don't need somebody who's talking and jumping up in the spirit. Yes, I see black people like that too. And they ain't doing nothing to advance the cause of liberation for black people or for Puerto Ricans. 
So what we need, I think, is a sense of wholeness. And if we start with the children, get into the public schools, make sure the Puerto Rican materials are in the hands of public school teachers. Let people know who Tito Puente is. Let people know who, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Rafael Hernandez is. Let people know. Why would you teach a course on, on Bach and not teach a course on Eddie Palmieri? I believe, and by the way, he's, you know, he's known all over the world. Love your culture, love your music. That our people will begin to understand. You know what's going to happen? More and more whites are taking up Latin music. More and more whites are taking up Puerto Rican history. And you go to some of these clubs and you see these white boys dancing and these white girls dancing and you say to yourself, holy cow. It's only when white people do it that we respect it. I say if we want to change in Puerto Rican attitudes, get a group of white girls, you know, you know, you, and some white guys and, and say, come to Puerto Rico. We're waiting for you. I'm telling you. There'll be a mad rush over there because we believe that white people have the answer. I don't care how we get it, but let's do it. In fact, I know some uh, Puerto Rican medio claro who are more black than the black people. Jerry Gonzalez was one of them, a great musician. He just died. Um, we, have, we, have, we have work to do. We have a lot of work to do. But how, first start with the youth. How can we activate a young lord's kind of advocacy in Rochester? We I don't think we need to. Papi, let me stop you there. I don't think we need to. I think we should not go to the past for, for our, our, new, our new development. Try something new, Papa. I truly hope the unity that you speak of will become a reality in Rochester, a unified sense of history devoid of separatist thinking regarding our African roots. There is a cultural divide which lessens our impact politically, economically, and socially. That was I agree. I agree. From Sean Nelms. As Puerto Ricans living in that diaspora, what is our responsibility to Puerto Rico? Um, it is visceral. It is um, spiritual. It is um, primordial. We need to know that that island is ours. We need to feel it, feel the earth. Yo, si yo no voy a Puerto Rico, I get a little crazy. I don't know how this is. I was born here. Si yo no voy a Puerto Rico, me pongo estúpido, antipático. To the point where my son says, okay, dad, time to go to Puerto Rico. I start saying curt things. Empiezo a usar palabras malas all the time. I tell people to go after themselves. They say, oh, you need a break. That's it. You need to go to Puerto Rico. Right now, I'm planning a trip. Because I've had, it's too much that's been happening in this city. Um, the only way you can establish that is by going there, getting to meet the people there, establishing your familial contacts there. A lot of people have lost their families. They, they, don't, they don't really know um, the, 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 you know, the, the Carmen or whatever it is. Go and check out your, your, your roots. I wish I had family in Puerto Rico. Most of my family came here in the 1920s, 25. My grandmother came in 1920. My mother was born in 25. So we've been here 100 years. Go to Puerto Rico. Spend money. Go to Loisa. Go to Piñones. By the way, Piñones is all Dominican now. So is Santurce. Um, and read. There are two books I would like you to read. One is War Against All Puerto Ricans. Have you read it? That one, no. Oh, one. Papa. Julio, you got to read this book. Let me see the book you just put up. This is the African American and Latin history. Him. It's hard oh, to okay. see because of the background. Um, Adrian, Adrian, you got to get him that book, man. War Against All Puerto Ricans. I told and him Ricardo. about it. I, I, read, I even got the audio book. Well, get him the book. He needs it. it He's got to read it. <laughs> All right, there's another one called La, La, La Casa de Cuatro Piso. And it shows you the evolutionary history of Puerto Rico from a political standpoint. And how we ended up being afraid of blacks and all that stuff. The problem with black Puerto Ricans is that when Haiti hit, when the slaves in Haiti took over the greatest army, standing army in Europe, Napoleon's, and beat them, I mean beat them. Jefferson got scared, everybody got scared. And Puerto Rico began to say, if you see Haitians on the street, turn them in. 
You know, we had passbooks in Puerto Rico. You couldn't move from one town to the other without showing your ID. It was like South Africa. Because the mulatto and black population was so great, they were getting scared. Jefferson, the great liberator, was the first one who said, we gotta be careful with these guys. <laughs> They're serious. So La, la, la Casa de Cuatro uh, Piso is one, and um, War Against All Puerto Ricans is another. All right. uh, understand this, the government, our government has agents in every sector of Puerto Rican, uh, of Puerto Rican territory, every sector. Don't think you're gonna get away with thinking you can slide. They know who we are and they don't wanna lose their little encampment there. Munoz Marin made a serious mistake when he decided to give up the land for the small for for the benefit of a few jobs now i i empathize with him people were starving in puerto rico my grandmother used to grab me by my shirt and say cállate la boca tú no sabes lo que tú estás hablando because i didn't understand what the hunger was in puerto rico at that time i said i would have never given my land to cállate la boca muñoz marín at that time really didn't have an alternative according to her our bellies were distended our hair was red which means we were malnourished. We've had problems in Puerto Rico. Um, we're still poor, but there's something about that island that I am so in love with. No importa la pobreza, you go there. Como esta mi hermano, buen provecho. It's just, I don't know how to explain it. I love my culture. I love it. Y a mí no me importa si el tipo de club náutico, un blanco, rubio, me mira mal. I don't care. As long as he don't put his hands on me, it's cool with me. You know, um, but I see, I love, I love Puerto Rico's dirty drawers, man. Gotcha. All right, for the sake of time, we're a little bit past um, four o'clock. Um, I wanna once again, thank you uh, for taking the time to, to speak with us, to give us some background, not only on what it means to be Afro-Latino, but to also, um, how to become a better ally, how to become a better um, individual that's fighting for the change that we're looking for. Um, I definitely appreciate everyone on this call. Um, I know that, you know, some of, some of the language, some of the verbiage um, is not something that everyone would agree with, but Felipe Luciano is not a man that bites his tongue for no one. Um, so I definitely, you know, want to make sure that everyone understands that everything that we've done here um, today is really to speak to who we are, where we are, and how do we get to where we want to go, how we're able to better um, advocate for ourselves and advocate for others. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of you for your time. Felipe, I want to thank you, sir, for your time, for being with us. Oh, no um, problem. And Julio, once may, again, Julio, may I interrupt you and just say something before we leave? Yeah. Latino. When you realize that the person you're hanging out with, the person you're in love with, the person who you share a pillow with is a dream killer, get rid of them. Too many of us are with people who have no dreams and want us to stay broke, poor, in despair and depressed. Be careful with that. It is why we have not risen. A lot of it is interpersonal relationships. Be careful with a guy who tells ah, tú quieres hacer todo esa cosa, tú quieres ser doctor, tú estás loco, negro. Drop him like it's hot. Sister, if you have a lab tomorrow and this guy is telling you, stay with me, baby, we, do, we, you know, we get it on, we get it on, we'll be passionate and stuff, but you're going to miss your lab tomorrow? Tell him, baby, if you love me, you'll let me go back home and get ready for this test tomorrow. You got to be careful with who you hang with. I find the dream killers abound even in our own families. Cuidado, number one. Number two, find people in other communities who you can be inspired by. Jews, Italians, African-Americans, find and, and hang with them. You, tú no me puedes decir que tú eres uh, Afro-Latino and you don't know one black family intimately. Come on now, know who they are and understand what, that, what, that, what that's about. Go to a black church, hang out, find out what's really going on. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll discover some things about yourself that you didn't know. Con eso te lo digo todo.